Well, dearly beloved in Christ, grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and from God our Father. Amen. My entry point for coming into our text today in Philippians chapter 2 was, was kind of hijacked early in the week, given the events that, that took on. Nonetheless, it's still really about living in a supportive Christian community. And I think, I think the events that happened in Evaldi, Texas, show that need more and more, clearly for me today, and I pray for you as well. Such unspeakable tragedy visited upon the people. 19 children, two teachers, who lost their lives, almost unbelievable, certainly unthinkable and unexpected. And yet I know we, we learn of these tragedies all too often. And I know your heart, our hearts ache for each parent who lost someone they love most. I've had people come into the office this past week. We've shared our grief and anguish. And our, our ache and our tears have often turned to prayers for the people. And I want to say thank you to everyone who joined in this past Wednesday evening just as we virtually gathered as a church wherever we are at to remember the people of Uvalde in a time of prayer. And we're calling for another uh, moment of that this coming Sunday, just this, tonight now, this Sunday evening at 6.30, wherever you're at, to just take a minute of silence and a moment to pray. Pray for the people of Uvalde and pray for our nation. I mean, how do we process such an evil act? How can we find words to give expression to the cry of our own hearts, let alone for those devastated by this tragedy? And where can we find the support that's necessary to even begin to hope that life can be bright and cheerful once again for the people of Uvalde. For those families ambushed by this tragic shooting, they are going to need others, the care and support of others to get them through each day, perhaps for the rest of their lives. These are scars that last a lifetime. And how can the world ever go back to the way it was when so much bad has happened. Now I, I pray that this kind of evil never visits you. That, that's why it's so important as we pray regularly when we do in the prayer our, our Lord and Savior taught us to pray, deliver us from evil. It's a tangible real need, is it not? And that's a, it's a meaty part of this prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray, deliver us from evil. And yet I know some of you have had evil touch your own lives. And for many, certainly hardships, even tragedy is struck. When you can feel like the rug's been pulled out from under you in your life and you feel like you're falling down into a pit of darkness, wondering how life can ever be light and bright again when so much bad has happened. Some of you have been there. Some of you might be there even now. Even with your going to church face on, inside you're wondering, Lord, can life ever be put back aright? I'm reminded of a scene, you're getting to know me as, I'm a bit of a movie buff, and in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the second movie, The Two Towers, sorry it's too much nerdiness for you there to follow, but it's in the second movie, toward the end, these, the, these two best friends, Frodo and Sam, Samwise, they're just devastated by what's going on in their world. It's just being crushed. It's so dark. And they're wondering, how can things ever be made right again? And so they're having this, they're dealing with this question. How can life ever be put back together in a good way when so much bad has happened? And says, Sam says it this way, it's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here. But we are. 
It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end. Because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad has happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come, and when the sun shines, it will shine all the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you, that meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I, I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back. Only they didn't because they were holding on to something. To which Frodo asks, what are we holding on to, Sam? And after a pregnant pause, even Gollum is waiting to hear Sam's response who says this. That there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Friends, that's the posture God has taken toward you and to me. You were worth fighting for. That's why God the Father sent his son to redeem us, to save us. And God calls us as his people today also to fight for one another. Isn't it something how it's in moments of crisis, sometimes it brings the best out in us, doesn't it? But what if we could be at our best for one another, even in the, the day in and day out ebb and flow of life? Today's message in this text we're in this series on the journey of a disciple, and today's movement is moving from self to others. From living for your own self and your own interests to being willing to serve and even sacrifice for the sake of others. Isn't that a fitting message for Memorial Day weekend? And you and I are called, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, to be willing to sacrifice for one another in time of need, and in all times, as God in Christ has done for us. In our text in Philippians chapter 2, and I know I, I've seen some of you bringing your Bibles, I like to see that, or you can turn in your devices, Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at the first 13 verses. In our text today, the Apostle Paul is writing to the struggling church in the city of Philippi. That's where we get the, the name Philippians from. It's a church that he started where he suffered persecution himself. And this church that he's writing to in the New Testament, that church would soon be under tremendous persecution and struggle. And Paul himself knows what that's like. He wrote a lot of the New Testament from prison or from confinement. Paul knows what it's like when, to have life turn against you and things to go bleak and dark. And he looks to the Lord, and he looks to God's people for strength, sustenance, and support. And so listen carefully as I read from our text. First 13 verses of Philippians chapter 2. Paul writes, and God says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our God and Father, as we look into your word this day, we give you thanks for sending your Son. Lord Jesus, we exalt your name. In our hearts right now, we bow our knee and declare you as King of kings and Lord of lords, our Savior and friend who gave yourself for us. Now by your Holy Spirit and through your word, work in us to act and to will according to your good purposes for the sake of others. I pray this, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. You know, this text really lays out for us the whole groundwork for how to live in loving, supportive Christian community. You know, Nowhere in what I just read to you is the sense of a Christian kind of living just their own faith on their own, kind of like a Lone Ranger Christian. There's no such thing in the scriptures. Being a follower of Christ implies, it assumes, it actually even commands living in relationship, sacrificial serving relationship one toward the other. And why? Why is this so? Even Jesus himself did this. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, I know the Trinity's, you know, quite a thing to get your mind around, and it's going to be a lifelong challenge, and I can't wait to hear it from God himself, how this all works, but we have God the Father, that implies a relationship. God the Son, it implies a relationship. The Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, mutually submissive, and in command. If you want to know who God is, look no further than Jesus. Jesus himself even said, if you've seen the Son, then you've seen the Father. And the work of the Holy Spirit sent by Father and Son, look up the Athanasian Creed on this, lifts up Jesus before us. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We have a relational God, the God of the Scriptures, the one and only true God of all creation, is a relational being. And so it makes sense that we, his creation, would also be made in the image of God, as the scriptures say, to live in relationship one with another. And some of you know this more deeply than others, as your life has become at different times, and maybe even now, hard-pressed. Perhaps even like the people in Uvalde, full of darkness right now. And we need one another to reflect God's love and care, to be reminded of God's plan and his comfort, to be the hands and the feet and the embrace of God himself, the body of Christ, living and serving one another. So this whole journey of a disciple means moving from living for yourself to living for others. But you know what? I don't want to just gloss over and say, yeah, do it. You can do it. No, I don't know. I struggle myself sometimes, and I bet you might as well. Because when your interests, your real genuine interests, things you care deeply about, are, are threatened or challenged because someone else has a different perspective, who are you going to put first? You or someone else? And if you're at all like me, I'll just confess it. I I have self-serving tendencies, and I bet you you might as well. And so it's God's Spirit, through his word, because of Christ, at the command of God the Father, we are called to live in service toward one another, 
even sacrificially. This is what Jesus did in our text. Listen to part of our text is kind of restated in the message paraphrase from Philippians 2 beginning at verse 5. In the message, the scriptures say, Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't look so much of him, think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, becoming human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Paul is calling us to look to Jesus as not just the example, but the source for the power to live in a posture of service towards others, even sacrificially so, just as Christ has done. We can hear often in churches, hey, you should become more like Christ, to become Christ-like. It might be a desire of your heart. Well, listen to what the scripture says that it means to be like Christ, to not cling to advantages in your life. Have you ever thought about that, being Christ-like? It means that you willingly set aside special privilege that you may have to humble yourself, meaning to live selflessly or living for the sake of others and being obedient in this sacrificial serving lifestyle and heart as you sacrifice for the sake of others, even when it challenges your own interests, and maybe even when it feels like it's going to kill you to do so. Because you know what? It killed Christ. Christ died for you and for me to redeem us. The ultimate sacrifice that he now calls us to follow him into as well. You know, the text today, and it's the word is included in here, living in a way when you move from self to others is summed up in one word and don't let its familiarity make it too small a thing. It's the word humility. To be humble. To be willingly humble. Being humble is the antidote to living for self, which the Bible says here is really nothing more than selfish ambition or vain conceit. And hey, I know we're not going to be... we're. We're not going to be so raw in how that gets shown. We're going to be more nuanced and sophisticated in how we protect our own interests. But God calls us to set that aside, take that off, and rather put on the clothing, the garments of servanthood, of serving others, even when it means sacrificing yourself. That's what we remember and celebrate Memorial Day itself. It's what we want for anyone protecting our children in our schools, isn't it? It's what your neighbor needs from you as they are struggling with life. And it's what you, yourself, also need and desire. The support and care, service of others who are looking out for your interests. Isn't that the kind of Christian community you want to live in? And isn't that the kind of Christian community God is calling you to create and to be? So if there's one thing I'd like you to take, if you only took one thing away from today's message, it's this. To be willingly humble with others by continually looking to Jesus. Because if you're at all like me, your own resources for living a life of service and of serving others is a finite, limited resource. So we look to the living, infinite God by his Holy Spirit, following Christ to live a life of service and even of sacrifice for the others. It's as we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, that we then 
have the ability, the will to act, as the scriptures say, according to God's purpose as he works in us what is pleasing to him and serving to one another. The Apostle Peter writes about it this way in 1 Peter 5. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. That's the kind of Christian community we want to be at victory, don't we? To clothe ourselves with humility toward one another. Peter goes on to say, because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So he writes, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Friends, that's what Jesus has done for you. He left the Father's side, humbled himself under God's mighty hand, served you and I at our greatest need to the point where it called for him to give up his own life, which he did willingly. And in due time, God raised him up and lifted him up. And one day, every knee will bow before Jesus and every tongue confess that he is Lord many of us out of love and reverence and worship, and everyone else out of fear and trembling, as he indeed is the God of the universe before whom every knee will bow. And so, dear friend, our need, your need for Christian community is very real. And the opportunity for you to be that kind of loving servant toward one another is available for you every day. And it's maybe especially at times when you feel like your own interests are maybe going to be challenged or overlooked as you try to serve others, that that's the way God wants you to sacrifice your life. Thankfully, he's not calling you to actually give your life, at least not at this moment, for the sake of others. And just as we are grateful for those who gave their lives for our own country and our freedom, and as we are especially grateful to God Almighty, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for you, let us follow in his footsteps in our own journey as a learner, a disciple of Jesus, and be willing to live in a humble state, a posture of a servant, even willing to sacrifice one for the other. Let's pray. Living God, Father, Son, Spirit, you've loved us so much and given yourself. Lord Jesus, you died for us. Our Father, you raised him from the dead. Spirit of God, you have created new lives in us. You've exchanged our hearts of stone for that of flesh that we might know you, believe in you, and then be empowered by you, Spirit of God, to live a life of serving others, even sacrificing ourselves for the sake of others. May that be your mark upon us as your people. To the glory of your name, Lord Jesus, in which I pray. Amen.